We are uh, going to turn to the scripture then, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 15 this morning. Luke chapter 15, and the parable of the good father. You don't know the parable of the good father, do you? <laughs> A lot of times we call this one the parable of the prodigal son, but uh, I've renamed it this morning for the sake of what we're going to do. It's going to be called the parable of the good father because a lot of times we look at this as from the son's perspective to where we are turning from God and coming back to him. But we're going to examine what the father's role was in this parable this morning and maybe some principles that we can we can get out of it. Um, you know, there was a, I, this isn't a true story from my life at all, but I'm just going to tell you. Uh, this, this, there's this story of a young boy who had just gotten his driver's license. And he was the son of a minister, of a pastor. And uh, so he came to his dad and he says, you know, I'd like to discuss using the car. You know, I mean, have a use of the car when I need to go places and things like that. And, well, his father took him aside and he said, well, son, he said, we need to have a talk about the use of the car. He says, you know, I'll make a deal with you. He said, if you bring your grades up, he says, you study your Bible some, and you get your hair cut, <laughs> then we'll talk about it. Well, about a month went by, and the boy, he began to work at his grades, and his grades started to come up, and, and uh, he knew that he had been reading his Bible, and so he asked his father again in about a month if he could sit down and discuss the use of the car now that he had his license. And so they went again, went again they sat down with the father and the son, and Father says, son, you know, I've been real proud of you. Your grades have been coming up. You've worked hard on this. And I see that you've been studying your Bible diligently. And he says, but you didn't get your hair cut. Well, the son said, he waited a moment. He says, you know, he says, father, I've, I've been studying the scripture. And he says, you know, there's a whole group of people in the Bible called the Nazarites. And they, they had made a vow that they wouldn't cut their hair. They were dedicated to God. And, you know, there were people like Samson like this. He says, and, you know, probably Jesus even had long hair. And father says, well, you're right, son. He said, and they walked everywhere they went. <laughs> Some wisdom for fathers this morning. <laughs> let's, uh, let's look at Luke and the, and the story of Luke chapter 15. Verse 11, here's the parable of the good father. He says, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants, and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and he would not go in. Therefore his father came out, 
and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll look to this this morning. Dear Lord, we once again thank you that you are the great model of the Father that we, um, that we all aspire to be. That you have shown us mercy and grace. That in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have... Uh, allow that to be modeled for us in flesh. And we thank you for the truths that, that, um, that we can find from your word that will guide us and, and help us to adhere to the, the truths that we need to live by. We pray this morning that you might help us to uncover just a few of those truths and apply them to our hearts. Whether we're fathers or mothers or young people, I pray that you might stir us and show us the need to be more like you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Called my message this morning, The Priorities of a Good Father. You know, all of us, whether you're a father or wherever you're at in life, we all have priorities. Things that inform our decisions. I'd rather do this than that. I'd rather, rather have, have this for, for today than that. I, I, I tend to do this instead of doing that. These are ways that we think. These are ways that we, we act and react sometimes to, um, to people around us. And they really define what our priorities are all about. I want us to look this morning at some of the priorities we see that this good father had in this parable of the lost son. We, um, we first see this at the beginning of the story. We know the story well, so I don't need to go, go through it um, line by line. But, of course, this is Jesus talking. We don't know that these were um, real people, per se, but this was a story to illustrate a biblical truth. And, of course, oftentimes we draw the biblical truths of the fact that God is always willing to take us back, allow us to be called his sons. And that's a great truth, isn't it? God wants us to know him as, his, as our father, as in a personal relationship. He doesn't want us to go astray. He doesn't want us to live according to our own lusts and desires. He wants us to accept his son, to accept the free gift of salvation, and to know that we can have a home in heaven for eternity. And he is always willing, no matter where, how far we've strayed, to take us back and to put us on the right path with him. But this morning, I want us to really, instead of focusing on, on that lesson of the story, I want us to draw some lessons from the model that we see in the good father. Now, as a parable, it is a earthly story with a spiritual lesson, right? And the, if the prodigal son represents who we are, who we've strayed from God, we've turned from him, and we have to turn back to him, then what does the father represent? Oh, it represents God the father, right? That we have to turn back to him. So this is a model of who God is and how he relates to us. And it also then, because it's an example of who God is, as fathers, as parents, whatever you need to do in life, it also informs us to how we should live and how we should be. And so we see here in the parable of the lost son, it says a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And there's a period. There's nothing else. And we see the next sentence says, and he divided unto them his living. Now, I don't know what happened between the period of that first sentence and the beginning of the next sentence. But we aren't told. We are told without, maybe without hesitation, maybe without anything else, that the, father, the son came with an extraordinary request, didn't he? Hey, I want my inheritance now. I want what's coming to me now. I'm not willing to wait for it. I've got my eye on things that I want to go do in life, and I want you to fund that for me, Dad. And what does the dad do? 
He gives it to them. <laughs> now, this seems counterintuitive to what we would think a good father should do. But yet it informs us what are the priorities of a good father. And I think the first thing I think that we, we need to th get in our minds, maybe something, again, counterintuitive, we need to sometimes put giving before lecturing. To put giving before lecturing. You know, I don't know about you, we all tend as fathers to have the speech ready, right? So somebody comes, they want this, they want that, they've got, and we have the speech. And they know they're coming with the speech. The kids know the speech is coming. Well, you know, the grades aren't there. I have this reason. I have that. We have all kinds of things we want to lecture about, don't we? <laughs> Instead of saying, hey, you know, what do you need? What can I give you? What can I give you? Now, that's not to say that lecturing isn't needed. Do you think that the, that the father had a, a, an inkling of what the son was going to be doing with all this inheritance? If he knew his son at all, he probably knew what path he was already on. We all know our kids well enough to know the direction that they're headed. <laughs> and sometimes we say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm put, put an end to this, and we have to. You know, sometimes we do. Sometimes they need a lecture. Sometimes they need some information. But sometimes they just need to know that we love them, that we will provide for them, that we will meet their needs. The good father put giving before lecturing. You notice that he doesn't withhold things from his children for selfish reasons. Sometimes our lecturing is valid and needed and maybe even well received. Sometimes we just lecture because we don't want to give something that maybe selfishly we want to keep to ourselves. And that's, that's really convicting sometimes. When we think about the fact that how many times have I used my lecture or used my speech as an excuse to not give to my kids? We need to put giving before lecturing. And you notice that he doesn't even withhold something that he believes will be used unwisely. That's really hard, isn't it? If you know that, boy, it's, it's maybe not the wisest thing. They're going to use this foolishly. They're going to use this in bad, bad ways. We don't want to do that. And, you know, it takes a lot of wisdom sometime to know what should we give and what, when should we withhold. But we have to be uh, asking ourselves the question, what would God do? Sometimes God gives, sometimes he doesn't. But God always has a desire to give, right? That's what the heart says. And God says, I always have the desire to give. What does he say? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't say, hey, I know you guys aren't worth it, so I'm not giving you anything. No, he gave his son. God loves the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. Did he know everybody was going to believe in his son? No. Nobody, not everybody does. But yet he gave his son so that people might believe. Those people that might turn to him have the opportunity to turn to him because he gave first. How often do we put that model into our own lives? Matthew chapter 7, Jesus speaks about this in a different context, but it still gives again the heart of God in this. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, um, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, if, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him. We don't deserve what God gives us, do we? He gives us blessings every day that we do not deserve. Does every blessing and gift that God gives us, do we use wisely? Nope. <laughs> A lot of times we spend his gifts foolishly. We use it on ourselves. We do things that we shouldn't do. We use, allow the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life to guide our decisions sometimes. Just like the prodigal son. Even those who know Christ as Savior, we still don't always spend God's gifts wisely. But yet God gives. 
He wants us to know. He wants us to live for him. He wants us to do the right things. And sometimes we do get the lecture. Sometimes we do get withheld. But, you know, ultimately God continues to give. His heart is to give. Instead of always asking yourself, give me a reason to say yes, we should be asking ourselves, give me a reason to say no. You ever thought about that? When someone comes to ask you for something, do you have, do you, do you start with the perspective of, I know I'm not giving it unless you convince me to give it to you. <laughs> I'm not giving it to you. What if we change that mindset and said, it's my desire to give just as God gives to me, unless I have a good reason not to. I need to have a reason not to give instead of a reason to give. The good father puts giving before lecturing. That's his heart, is to give. We see um, even the world, is this, this differentiates from the world. You notice as the son went and squandered his father's living, back to the parable in Luke 15, he gets down, he came, he, verse 17, it says he came to himself, uh, verse 16 rather, he says he would have fain filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And what happened? It says, no man gave unto him. Wow, this was in stark contrast to what his father did. His father gave him everything. And when he got down to the bottom of the barrel, he found that the world gave him nothing. Don't we want to be identified with the way the Father gives? God the Father gives to us. When we give, it's a model of who God is in our lives. And it differentiates us from the world around us. We need to be giving before we're lecturing. And then we go down to verse 18 and 19. The, the son comes, he says, I comes to himself and he says, you know what? I'm not going to keep living like this. He says, I know my father's character. I know who he is. I know what he's about. And he realizes that I could go and get a job. He would give me a job. He would, he would, he would give me something better than I have right now. Again, what does he know about his father? His father is a giving father. And in verse 19, he finally wakes up to that fact. And he says to himself, I will arise. I will go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against thee, against heaven and before thee. And no more am I worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Verse 20 says, he arose, he came to his father. And then what happens? When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The second priority of a good father is that he puts loving before judging. He puts loving before judging. How quick would you be to see this kid who's just squandered your living and run your name through mud and turned what could have been a great life for himself into a disaster? Come back. You say, boy, I finally see him. I'm going to have all this time till he get to figure out what I'm going to say to him. I told you so. I told you this wasn't going to work out. You don't deserve, you know, you, you know what would run through your head. <laughs> you want to tell that kid that you were right and he was wrong. You want to tell him that, that you deserve everything that you got. You should have listened to me. That's our gut reaction most of the time, isn't it? But what does the father do? He says, I'm not going to start by judging. The kid deserved judgment, right? The kid deserved to know how bad his decisions were. But you know what? He was feeling that for himself. He didn't need his father to tell him that. He had already recognized the fact he had made a mess of his life. Now, at some point, I'm sure his father had to have a discussion with him about what this all meant. Because there are always consequences to bad decisions, aren't there? Sure there are. There's always going to be judgment from bad decisions. But the father says, you know, before you need that from me, you need to know that my love never fails. You're going to get love before you get judgment. That's the priority in my mind. It says his father saw him. He had compassion and he ran. Ran to show him he was loved fell on his neck, and he kissed him. He wasn't so quick to say, I told you so. And you know, we don't even know at this point in time that the father knew that the son really had even learned his lesson. Have you ever thought about this? 
For all he knew, the son may have been coming back to ask for more money. <laughs> we don't know. I mean, we know from hindsight what's, what happens with the story. But the father, he didn't, not one word came out of the son's mouth before the father went after him. The love compelled him. Doesn't love supposed to compel us? The Bible says we are constrained by love to tell others of Christ. We are constrained by love, God's love in us, to show that his love never fails. God the Father puts loving before judging. An illustration comes from a, a story back in the 1700s. There was an old man who stood on a Virginia riverbank many years ago, and he was waiting to cross the river. It was a bitterly cold day, and at that time there weren't any bridges to get across the river. It wasn't a real deep river, but it was too, uh, too, too cold and too swift for him to go across on foot. So he was going to just wait there, and hopefully someone would come along. He could catch a ride to the other side, maybe someone on horseback. After a lengthy wait, he spotted a group of horsemen approaching, and he looked at the first horse that came by and the, the man riding it, and he let them pass on. Then the second one came along, and he looked up at that person, and he just let them pass on. And this happened again with the third one, and then the fourth one, and then the fifth. There was one rider left in the group. And as he saw this last rider, he looked up at the man on the horse, and he quickly asked the old man, the old man looked him in the eye and he said, Sir, would you give me a ride across the river? The rider immediately replied, Certainly. And once across the river, the old man slid down to the ground and the rider said, Sir, before leaving, he says, I could not help but notice that you permitted all these other men to pass by without asking for a ride. He says, Then when I came up, the last rider in the group, you immediately asked me to carry you across. I'm curious why you asked that you didn't ask them, but you did ask me. The old man quietly responded, well, he says, I looked into each of their eyes and I could see that they had no love. And I knew in my own heart that it would be useless to ask for a ride. But when I looked into your eyes, I saw compassion. I saw love. I saw a willingness to help. And I knew that you would be glad to give me a ride across the river. The writer was very touched, and he says, I'm very grateful for what you said. I appreciate it with very much. And with that, Thomas Jefferson turned and rode off to the White House. <laughs> Sometimes people can look in our eyes and know if there's love there. They can look in our faces and know if we have compassion towards them. If we will do something to help. Have you ever looked in the face of someone and knew there's no point in even asking? <laughs> Who are we as fathers? When our sons, when our children, when our wives look at us, do they see someone who's hard, judgmental, ready to say, I told you so? Or are they ready to say, there's someone who loves me? They put loving before judging, just like the good father in the story. Let's continue then. We'll see another priority in Luke 15. We see in verse 20 that he had compassion, that he ran, that he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Then in verse 21 and verse 22, we see the son's response. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But here's the father's response. Verse 22, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. What's the third priority of a good father? He puts rejoicing before rebuking. He puts rejoicing before rebuking. This kind of goes along with judgment again. But the, certain, the son certainly deserved rebuke, didn't he? He certainly deserved rebuke. Was he worthy to be called his son anymore? No. No. He wasn't worthy. None of us are ever worthy to be called God's sons and daughters. But yet, God rejoices over one sinner that repents. Was he a disgrace to the family? Yeah, he was a disgrace. 
And was the father just overlooking all this? Say, well, you know, we'll just ignore the fact that you just did all this, that you took this. No, he wasn't overlooking this. There was no sense that, hey, the, 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 the kid wasn't going to get the judgment and the rebuke at some point. The point was this. The father says the priority at this point in time is to rejoice that you're back. God, God rejoices when we come into his fold. And we, you know, we deserve rebuke. We deserve sometimes the judgment of God. We deserve to get the consequences of our actions. And you know what? In this life, oftentimes we do. If we go to the, you know, if we, if we, we think life's so bad and we go down to the train tracks and say, I'm just going to give it all up and give up on God. I give up on everything and I'm going to tie myself to these train tracks and allow the train to, ta to, to, to take my life. And the train comes and takes off one of our legs, but doesn't kill us. And we, through that incident, realize that, hey, you know, God is uh, spared my life. I can, I can take God at his word, and we turn to God. Does God put our leg back? No. We'll, we're saved. We're his son. We're part of his family. We're known by him. We're loved by him. But we still will live with the consequences. Consequences will continue to haunt us. But you know what? When we go to God's fold, he says, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice that you're with me now, that you know me. And he knew that there would be consequences for his son. He says, my son was dead and is alive again in verse 24. He was lost and he's now found. And in verse 24, he says, they began to make merry. You notice, too, here, as far as rejoicing, that the father sets the tone of the whole household. Father sets the tone. He says, imagine if the father had received him and said, yep, that worthless guy, he just came back. Let's go, you know, somebody fix him a plate and let him eat in a barn tonight. No, he sets the tone. He says, we're going to make merry. We're going to rejoice. We're going to have a time of celebration. For the fact that my son is back. You know the father sets the tone in our homes as well. The father has a great responsibility spiritually and just emotionally sometimes. You come dragging in after a long day and you've got the chip on your shoulder. Maybe a couple chips on both shoulders. And uh, you're just waiting. <laughs> waiting for that short fuse to be lit so that you can go off on someone or something. You know we all have those days. As men, as fathers, it happens. We have to recognize in those times that we're setting the tone. What's the tone going to be in our home? Is it going to be a time of celebration, a place of joy, a place where God is honored, a place where love is seen and felt? Or is it going to be a place of harsh words, a place with short tempers, a place filled with anger? We don't want that. We set the tone. Here the father decided to put the priority on rejoicing over rebuking. And he ultimately set the tone for his whole household. Luke 15, even earlier on, it says, he says, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. God is ultimately setting the tone in heaven. And he sees us as sinners. He sees us as those in need of judgment. And he knows we're going to live with our consequences. But when we turn to him, he rejoices. And that can be the tone in our life too. Our consequences, our situation, our circumstances do not have to inform our mentality, how we're living, how we're responding. We can be something different through God. And then we're going to continue. Let's look at this last priority of the father. We see, go down to verse... Um, we see now the, the older son, he comes into the picture in verse 25. The elder son was in the field. He didn't even realize his brother had come home. He was still out working. And he hears the music as he comes back to the house, and he doesn't know what's going on because this was out of the ordinary, wasn't it? This wasn't the typical, oh, it's somebody's birthday, I forgot. What, what is it? What's going on here, you know? Did I miss a holiday? I mean, he didn't know what was going on. He comes back and he hears the music and he sees the dancing. And so he calls one of the servants over and asks, what's this all about? Verse 27, 
The servant says to him, Thy brother is come, thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And again, there's the period and the reaction. The son says, He was angry. He was angry, and he would not go in. He was angry, he was stubborn. He recognized what his brother had done. He had been stewing about it probably for years. From the time that brother left and went to live high on the hog on half the inheritance, the son had obviously allowed bitterness to get in. And there was now a division, probably not only between the brother, but between the son and the father. Because he was probably angry with his father, not just for making Mary with the son, but also for the fact that, why did you do this in the first place? Treated him this way and you didn't treat me that way? There was division. It had come from bitterness. It had come from anger. And now it all kind of explodes at the presence of the brother coming back and this party that was thrown. But what does the father do? What's his reaction? The father doesn't tell the servant, send him in. <laughs> no, the father goes out. He says the father, he, because he would not go in. The, the, the son was, was angry. He was stubborn. He says, I'm not going in. You just see him crossing his arms, putting his foot in the ground. I'm not going in. So what does the father do? Get over it. <laughs> you get in here. No. The father says, I'll come to you. I'll come to you. It says, he went outside. His father came out and says he entreated him. He entreated him. What does the father put as a priority here? Reconciliation. He puts reconciliation ahead of any compensation that anybody was going to get through this situation. You know, the, the son felt like he was being unfairly treated. He felt like he was being unfairly compensated for the situation. He felt like the brother got better than he got. He felt like the compensation, the standards here weren't fair. And ultimately, he was angry about it. What does, he, what does the father do? He doesn't come out and say, hey, hey, you're going to get, you're going to, don't worry. We're, we'll, 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 we'll throw you a party next week. Well, don't worry, you, 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 no. What does he start with? Reconciling. And you know the first step that goes with reconciling that oftentimes we miss is the fact that sometimes we have to go. Sometimes we have to go to that person that we have the division with. Maybe they've got anger against us. Maybe they've got some division against us. And we have to humble ourselves and go. Was the father in the wrong? No, the father wasn't in the wrong. He had the right to do what he wanted to do. If this is a picture of God, the father, the just judge, the loving father, the one who, who gives to all men liberally and, and makes sure that everyone gets a fair shake, this is a picture of him, right? He did not do wrong in this. It was the son's reaction that was wrong. But yet God's thoughts were about re reconciling the division that was the most important priority for him at this point in time. His father came out and entreated him and ultimately told him in verse 31, all that I have is thine. You're going to get compensated. You're going to, you're going to be, get rewarded for your efforts. You're going to get rewarded for staying with me and staying true with me and knowing that, that, uh, you know, that, that you're, you're always going to be an heir to who I am and what I have here. He was assuring him of that. That your faithfulness is not going to go unrewarded. But what was the son's real problem? It wasn't that he was not faithful to his father. He allowed bitterness to creep in. And even though he had physically been doing the work in the field, physically been out supporting the family name, being the right, right kind of person wherever he went, it, he was doing all the right things. But you know, all that time, he was harboring division in his heart. How often do we go out? feel like, hey, I've got it all together. I'm doing the right things. I'm being faithful. And all the time we have division. Maybe division against a brother or a sister. 
someone in the church, someone that we know. Maybe it's a child. We have that division. We have that severed relationship that needs to be repaired. And we're not honoring God in that situation because we haven't put a priority on the reconciliation. We've all thought about, I'm going to get rewarded for my faithfulness, and we've forgotten the fact that God wants us to be reconciled. Not just reconciled to him, but reconciled to those whom we call brothers and sisters in Christ, those who we call our close family and friends. He doesn't want us to have division because people are always more important than things. Let me say that again, because I say this often in our home. People are always more important than things. Oftentimes we get that reversed, don't we? We get our eyes set on what I want, what I need. I need more money. I need the boat. I need some time off, I need whatever I need. And people are just the means to get there. They're the rug that we walk on to get to the place we're going. People are not the most important things a lot of times in the way we talk and act. We've got to make sure that people are always more important than things. The son had gotten this out of whack. He had his mind on all the things, all the things the father had given to the other son, all the things that he felt like he was missing out on, all the things that he was working hard for, not getting rewarded for, all things. And in the meantime, he had missed the people. He had missed the relationship he should have had with his brother. He should have missed the relationship he should have had with his father. He allowed the insides to be torn apart while on the outside striving for the things that he wanted. In his quest to do right and be rewarded for it, the other brother lost sight of the importance of his relationship with his brother and his father. He had worked so hard to get what he deserved, and he wanted his brother to get what he deserved. <laughs> right? In the negative sense. How often do we have the mindset, I want to get what I deserve? Well, we better not say that too loud when we think about God. Because God doesn't give us what we deserve. <laughs> God gives us grace. He gives us mercy. He gives us love. And he gives us the opportunity to have reconciliation. Because our God is a God of reconciliation. That's what he's all about. Reconciling himself to man. A holy God to a sinful man. That's what God's about. Reconciliation, not reward. We know that there's a time for reward. There's a time when hopefully we stand before the Lord and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we get the rewards of this life. We want that. We strive for that. We should be faithful to God, right? Those should be our things. But ultimately, we should be looking at that down the road. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 say, All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. How many times did that word reconciliation come up? <laughs> Just in two verses. God says, this time where you're living right now, this is not your time for reward. This is your time to spread the message, the news of reconciliation. Reconciliation to God through Christ Jesus. He says, if you can't even get along with your own brothers and sisters in Christ, how are you going to represent me faithfully that you can be reconciled to me? So often we think, I'm doing the right things. I'm living the right way. But you know what? I've got these people that I just can't get along with. <laughs> We've got the wrong priorities because God puts the priority on reconciliation. Are we a force for reconciliation in our marriages, in our homes, with our children? How can we expect to be God's ambassador to show others a reconciled relationship with God through Christ? when we have those in our lives who we continue to butt heads with, we continue to have division with, and we continue to allow to destroy us from the inside out. The priorities of a good father. He puts giving before his lecturing. He puts loving before his judging. He puts rejoicing before his rebuking. 
and he puts reconciling before his rewarding. Those other things come. They don't get diminished. They don't go away. But ultimately, when we put the priorities where God has put them, we'll find that we can represent him faithfully in our homes, in our marriages, and with our children in the lives that we live here on earth. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's take a moment to reflect this morning. Maybe these are some new ideas for you. Maybe these are ideas that, wow, I, 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 thought, I thought maybe I was doing things right till I realized where, where God has been with me. And I'm, I'm not here to be your conscience, but maybe the Holy Spirit's working in your life. And you just say, I don't care, men, women, whoever, th this is for everyone. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You might just say this morning, you know, I realize some of my priorities have been out of whack in how I've been living. And I see how God's treated me, and I, I realize I need to represent that better. And by God's grace, I want to do that. God, God's really prompted me in some areas this morning. I just want to pray for you this morning. Just raise your hand. Let me know. Hey, I, I, yes, I, I want to get my priorities right. I want to get my priorities back in where they need to be. Others, just raise your hand for a minute. I'd like to pray for you. Yes. Others. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the good father. We thank you that you've given us a great model by which we can live our lives. We confess that often we have decided to judge people instead of giving. We've oftentimes put rebuking people instead of rejoicing that they've come back to you. We've oftentimes downplayed our need to be reconciled with others and we've oftentimes just had our sights set on the rewards that you offer and the, the, the gifts that you give. And we've not given those same uh, luxuries to others around us. I pray for those this morning that have raised their hand that say, I want to really get the priorities back, in, back where they need to be. Help us, each of us, as fathers, as mothers, wherever stage we are in life, Lord, to have our priorities informed by who you are and how you've treated us. We thank you for that opportunity. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.